Hebrews chapter number 6. Hebrews chapter number 6. You know that we've been going through the book of Hebrews. The word to describe the whole book is better. It was written to Hebrews, and they, uh, some of them had come over to the Christian faith. And some of them were thinking and going back. Some of them have been faced tremendous persecution, wonder, maybe it's not worth it. And the whole book is to convince that what you have, what we have in Jesus Christ, is better. That's the whole theme of it. Uh, we, uh, last week, we're in Hebrews 6, 13 to 19. And there we covered some reasons why we believe in eternal security. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Hebrews 6 is often used as a chapter to convince people you can lose your salvation. And yet we found some very clear reasons why we believe once saved, always saved. Having said that, we kind of uh, glossed over the very last verse of Hebrews 6. And so that's where we're going to begin tonight, Hebrews 6 and verse 20. For this verse mentions somebody that's really a great mystery. I don't know that I've ever heard a message preached on it. And you know what? If I was jumping all over the Bible, I'd never preach on it, honestly. What do you do with it? And yet, uh, we preach through Hebrews. We've got to cover it. And so if we could read Hebrews 6, verse number 20, if we could read that together, reading it out loud, verse 20. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Preach, who is that? Well, that's what we're going to look at tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for each one that's here. Lord, I don't ever want to waste people's time in preaching. I think that every message ought to have something in it that we can learn, something in it that ought to be practical, that we can grow. And Lord, if that's true for every portion of the Bible, then it would have to be true of this portion too. Lord, we have bumped into the name of someone that very few would have anything to say about him. I pray to help us tonight. Direct our words, direct it. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. Help us from this. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Again, last week, why we believe in eternal security. We looked at three reasons last week. First of all, it was promised by God and then confirmed again after. Uh, you would have to cut out every verse that promises everlasting life, every verse that promises eternal life, for us to be able to lose our salvation. That was the first reason. The second one is the pledge that God made. He certified it by himself. And so if we could lose our salvation, God's reputation is at stake. God put his name on the line. We saw that last week. And then we ended with the person who is our contact is already waiting up in heaven. He is so completely finished the work of salvation that he is already up in heaven sitting down waiting for us. And so that's where we were last week. And you say, well, preacher, what are we looking at this week? Well, again, look at Hebrews 6 and verse 20. It says, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So that verse says that our high priest, who's up in heaven, he's just like Melchizedek. Pastor, who is that? Do you know the name Melchizedek only shows up 11 times in the entire Bible the first chapter is mentioned, one chapter in Genesis, then one chapter in Psalms, and then he's mentioned here nine times in chapter 5, 6, 7. And uh, I think that most people, if they're, on, if they're honest, they say, <laughs> who is Melchizedek? Quite honestly, as I approach this, uh, we, most of us have heard of Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon pastored in London, England. He was a pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And uh, many times Charles Spurgeon was asked to preach at other places. Many times he preached at Bible conferences, revivals. Most times when he was invited, he went. There's a few times that he was invited to preach elsewhere that he said no. 
And somebody asked him one time, why would you turn down an invitation? Why won't you preach there? Do you not like that church? Do you not like that preacher? Why? And he said, it has nothing to do with the church. It has nothing to do with the preacher. When they invited me to come, they gave me a text that they wanted me to preach from. And he said, quite honestly, there are some texts that I can't sink my fingers into. There are some Bible texts that I think someone else can do better service with that text. I thought of that this week. <laughs> Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do with this man. Why don't I just have... So I, I, I had the phone ready to dial some of you men. And the Lord said, no, no, you can't run from this man. You can't do that. Uh, when I say we're going to look at him, I think that, I don't think anyone, unless you read Hebrews, I don't think anyone thought of this man today. I don't think you thought of him this week, this month, this year. I, I could quite honestly say, I don't think some of you thought of him in your lifetime. Pastor, why would we look at someone that nobody knows anything about? Well, look again at Hebrews 6 and verse 20. The Bible says about our Savior, Jesus Christ, who's up in heaven waiting for us. Hebrews 6 and verse 20, whither the forerunner, that's Jesus, is for us entered, even Jesus, uh, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Pastor, why would we bother even to look at this? Because the writer of this book says that Jesus is just like Melchizedek. Jesus' ministry for us is just like the high priestly order of Melchizedek. That might not mean a lot to us. But I guarantee that for the Jews that this is primarily written to, that got their attention. Again, the book of Hebrews, just as a reminder, primarily was written to Hebrews. Uh, we read it because it's part of our Bible. We get truth from it. But uh, these that it was written to, many of them Jewish believers, uh, many of them had faced tremendous opposition now that they had become Christians. And because of the opposition, some of them were actually entertaining, maybe I should just throw to the side this Bible Christianity and go back to Judaism, go back to that Old Testament order. Look at the opposition some face. Keep your hand in Hebrews 6. Look there in Hebrews chapter 10. Again, Hebrews chapter 10. This is why some of them were thinking of going back. Hebrews chapter number 10, and look there, if you would, in verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, God opened your eyes to the truth, you endured a great fight of affliction. So they, some of them faced terrible affliction, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me in my bonds. Sure sounds like Paul wrote it. And took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Some of them, because of the Christian faith, uh, faith had faced such opposition, they were thinking, Maybe I should just go back. Maybe it wouldn't be that hard if I went back. After all, that Old Testament faith wasn't all that bad. And he's saying, hold on a minute. Even you know that Old Testament Levitical priesthood had its problems. All those Old Testament priests weren't perfect by any means. Some of them had grievous and horrible issues. And so those Jews knew, yeah, that wasn't perfect. And so in light of that, the writer here is saying, you don't want to turn your back on Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is of another priestly order. 
He's not of the Levitical order. He's not of the Aaron priesthood. They call it the Aaronic priesthood. He's not in that line. He's in another line. Pastor, you still haven't got my attention yet. If Jesus is more like Melchizedek's line, then Jesus is like Aaron's line. It's worthy for us to take a service and figure out what is this Melchizedek line. Look there in Hebrews 7, verse 4. This is the only command in these 25 verses that you and I are told to do with this subject. Again, Hebrews 7, verse 4. Now consider how great this man was. He's talking about Melchizedek. And so again, you say, well, preacher, honestly, if you gave me a piece of paper and asked me to write on that piece of paper everything I knew about Melchizedek, you'd get a blank piece of paper back. I understand that. You say, well, preacher, then why would we look at it? Because man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth of the mouth of God. If this man shows up 11 times in Scripture, it would be worthy for us to do as Hebrews 7, 4, to consider him. Consider how great this man was. And so if you're taking notes tonight, my title is What We Learn from Melchizedek. What we learn from Melchizedek. Say, how do you spell it? It's spelled two different ways in the Old Testament and New Testament. You can't go wrong. We're not going to mark your spelling tonight. So again, what we learn from Melchizedek uh, look there, if you would, in Hebrews 7, verse 1. Hebrews 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Uh, you know, what? I, I suppose if I asked many tonight, and I'm not belittling what you know or what you don't know. That's not my business. My business is to help you know more. <laughs> But if I asked most people where else in the Bible beside Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 7 would we find Melchizedek? Most people would say, I have no idea, and that's fair. Most would say, I couldn't even tell you where to begin to look. Hebrews 7 verse 1 helps us to know where to begin to look. Look at the verse again. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, so now that kind of puts us in a time frame where this, is, this unusual man showed up. He showed up in the life of Abraham. Well, that puts us there between Genesis chapter number 11 and Genesis chapter 25. Because those are the chapters that tell us about the life of Abraham. Hebrews 7 verse 1 tells us a little bit more, gives us a little more help. Again, Hebrews 7, 1, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abram, returning from the slaughter of the kings. So somewhere, this man, Melchizedek, he shows up when Abram is coming back from a battle, when Abram is coming back from a war. So now we're going to turn in our Bible to find that out. And so keep your hand in Hebrews. We're going to be back to it again. We're looking at what we learn from Melchizedek. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter 12. Now, I might never get a chance to preach on this man again. So let's cover it. Let's get what we can. I think that when we're done, you might have more questions than I can give answers. Having said that, uh, Hebrews 7, 4 said, consider this great man. So again, we're looking tonight what we learn from Melchizedek. So Hebrews 7, 1 gave us a little bit of hint. This man, Melchizedek, whoever he was, he met Abram when he came back from the battle, when he came back from a war, when he came back from a slaughter. That's in Genesis. The reason I had us go to Genesis, Genesis chapter 12 is when God called Abraham. Abraham lived in a place called Ur. He was content there. He was happy there. He was blessed there. He had riches there. God one day comes to Abram and says, I want you to leave this place 
and I want you to go to a place that I will show you. Look there in Genesis 12, verse number 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Show, not give, not hand over the ownership of. Show, now if I were Abram, I know I'm not, but if I were Abram, Lord, now let me get this straight. You want me to pack up everything that I have and move to a place that you're going to show me? I mean, this is like a sightseeing tour. I've got a big entourage, big assets. Really, Lord? And yet he does it. God said, if you'll do it, I'll make of you a great nation. I will bless you and bless those nations that help you. Look there in Genesis 12 and verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram does it, packs up his things, packs up his wife, takes his nephew Lot with him. They begin to make this journey, and they get to the land of Canaan. Well, because of his obedience, God now gives him a bigger blessing. Look, verse 6. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sikkim, also later called Shechem, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was in the land. So he went to Canaan. He went to Canaanite land when he got there, verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And so it's no longer to show. God said, now I'm going to give you the land. Well, Abram now said, well, the trip's worth it now. It's just not taking pictures and slides to send back to family. I'm going to get it. God promised him all of Canaan. That's Genesis chapter 12. You know, when you get to Genesis chapter 13, Abram himself has got very wealthy. His lot nephew has got very wealthy. So much was each of their wealth that there was a contention between them, Genesis 13. Abraham looks to Lot and he said, now Lot, this isn't good. Bad testimony for your people, my people, to be bumping heads, to have friction between us, just bad testimony. Abraham said, Lot, I'll tell you what, why don't you pick one way, I'll go the other. You pick one way, I'll go the other, and uh, Lot said, okay. You know, Lot looked uh, north and south and west and east. And when he looked east, he thought, that's where I want to go. Say, preacher, why did he decide that he was going to go that way? Well, look there in Genesis 13, verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord. I don't know what Lot knew about the Garden of Eden. But when Lot looked east, he said, it's just like the Garden of the Lord. I think that's the Garden of Eden. And so he decided by what he saw that uh, that's where he wanted. And so Lot said, I'm going that way. And Lot went that way. And Abram said, okay. And once Lot leaves... In Genesis 13, God said, I want you, Abram, to look north and west and south and east. I'm going to give all of this to you, Abram, and to your descendants. And maybe Abram said, well, God, I just gave Lot the east. He said, you can't give it away. I gave it to you. Incidentally, all that land still belongs to Israel. It doesn't matter what the United Nations decides. It doesn't matter what whoever the president of the United States, or the prime minister, it doesn't matter what anyone decides. God said to Abram, I don't care what you think you've given away, I've given it to you and your children and your children's children. Lot made a choice totally off what he saw, and that's always a bad choice. That's Genesis 13. Do you know when we get to Genesis chapter 14, if you have to turn the page, please do. Genesis chapter 14 is probably the first war the first battle that's recorded in the Word of God. Now, remember, Lot himself has moved into the city of Sodom. 
Sodom was one of five cities. We, we know Sodom, we know Gomorrah, but there were five cities that were kind of confederate right around the Jordan River. And so Lot is a part of those. Now, those cities were very wicked cities. They were very ungodly cities. In fact, uh, back there, if you would, to Genesis 13, and look at verse 13. Genesis 13, 13, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Lot moves, he's already moved in there. So uh, these five confederate cities, of which Sodom and Gomorrah were two of those five, they were very wicked. There were four nations that were north. If you had some geography, it's between the Euphrates River, the Tigris River, between those two rivers up north is called Mesopotamia. There were four cities up there. There were four nations there. There were five nations, cities here. Genesis 14 talks about the first war. The four cities, the four kings, decide they're going to bring all of their armies against the five cities, the five kings, of which uh, Lot is part of. In Genesis chapter number 14, the five cities lose the battle. And what you have in Genesis 14 is the four cities that were victorious, the four kings that won in the battle, took these from these five cities, and they took them all as prisoners, Back to Mesopotamia, Abraham hears about that. Abraham wastes no time. He arms all of his servants. The Bible says there were 318 servants. He gives all of them weapons to be able to go to fight, and that Abraham and his 318 armed servants go hot to trot after this entourage, after their head. And the Bible says in Genesis 14, Abram, with 318 armed servants, wins. Now, hold on, five cities couldn't knock back these. Abram, with 318 trained servants, he wins. And uh, look there, if you would, in uh, verse 15, Genesis 14, 15. Talking about Abram. Genesis 14, 15, and he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night and smote them and pursued them on Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot, we'd say nephew Lot, and his goods and the women also and the people. We went to Genesis 14 because Abram and his servants, they won the battle. They're now bringing back all of these from the five cities that had been enslaved. And when they come back, the Bible says they met two kings. Now, if you still have Hebrews 7, 1, if you don't, don't, don't lose Genesis 14 or Hebrews 7. But this is our first introduction to Melchizedek. Back in Hebrews 7, 1, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abram returning from the slaughter of the kings. So now we've got our story straight. What Hebrews 7, first of all, kind of uh, stirred our minds, ties back to Genesis chapter 14. So I've given you the background so you're not clueless on the story. So now Abram is coming back with his servants and with his nephew Lot and Lot's family and all the rest of the people from those five cities and uh, I'm sure Abraham was excited. Well, God, you gave us a great victory. How could 319 of us possibly defeat four kings, four cities that uh, five cities couldn't? I'm sure Abraham was rejoicing. Again, back there in Genesis 14. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedor Lomar, and of the kings that were with him in the valley of Sheva, which is in the king's dale. Again, I'm, I'm doing it slow so we, we don't lose it. Abram's coming back. He's, he, they're high-fiving. They're rejoicing. All those slaves have been set free. They're coming back. And when he comes back, two kings meet him. 
one of the kings, verse 17, is king of Sodom. Well, look at verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem. That's the first mention of this man, Melchizedek. You know, Melchizedek was one of two kings that met Abraham coming back from the battle. If you're taking notes, we're looking at what we learned from Melchizedek. I, if, if you <laughs> write something down, first is the presentation of Melchizedek. The presentation of Melchizedek. This is where we first hear about him. And really, he was a king that met Abraham returning from the battle. Now, there's a number of details that are very unusual about this. You say, oh, preacher, what? First of all, we recognize who the king of Sodom is. He was, one of those, he was a king of one of the five cities that had been taken captive. Now, that in itself sure does raise a lot of questions. If Abraham and his 318 servants are bringing back all of these that had been enslaved, and Sodom was one of the cities that were enslaved, how could the king of Sodom meet Abram when he was coming back? Did that king hide when those four nations were poor leadership? I'm just saying, you know what, if you're in the midst of a battle, that's not the time for leadership to abdicate. That's not the time for leadership to say, you know what, I, I think I'm going to take a vacation right now. So it raises a little bit of a question now. Is it this king of Sodom, who should have been one of the ones taken captive, how could he possibly meet Abram coming? So it's just an odd thing. But the first king, this king of Sodom, who is one of the five kings who'd been attacked, look there in Genesis 14, 2. Uh, verse 1 talked about the four cities that attacked them. But Genesis 14, 2, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom. And so we're guessing this verse 17, his name is Bera, king of Sodom. Uh, we, we understand who he is. But uh, being the king of Sodom, do you know he must have been a very wicked man because it was a very wicked city that he was a king of. I think that this king had no moral guidelines. I think that this king of Sodom, there was nothing right and there was nothing righteous about him. So we're getting a very negative picture of the one king that meets him. Well, what about this other king? Well, there in Genesis 14, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem. That's the other king. We see a preacher, what is Salem? Salem is not one of the five cities that were attacked. Salem is not one of the four cities that did the attacking. So although from the get-go we understand who the king of Sodom was, verse 17, we have no idea who the king of Salem was. Is Salem a city? Is Salem a people? Is Salem a culture? Truth is that uh, we're told that this king of Salem, look what it says in verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Now, we're doing it slow so we don't lose anyone in the shuffle. Abram with his 318 servants rejoicing about the great victories, coming back, bringing them back to the cities that they were taken captive from. Two kings show up. One is the king of Sodom, but he's a very wicked man because it's a very wicked city he's the king of. He has no scruples. He has no morals. He's, he, there's nothing right or righteous about that. Just a bad guy. Do you know there was another king? That's the king of Salem. We don't know where Salem is. We don't know uh, is Salem a city. But at this point, he, as bad as the king of Sodom was, this king of uh, Salem is good. The Bible says he's a priest of the Most High God. So the first detail that's so unusual is we don't really know who this second king is. I'll give you a second, a second detail that's very unusual. The, the stated purpose of each of these kings. Now we're going to get to something very practical. As Abram comes back, each of these kings have an agenda. Each of these kings have a stated purpose. 
I say, old preacher, what exactly is the stated purpose? Well, look there in Genesis 14 and verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return. So that's what we're talking about. Look there now in verse number 21. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. So as Abram and his 318 armed servants are coming back, he meets this king of Sodom, wicked guy, strange guy, immoral guy. And this immoral king says to Abram, listen, Abram, I want you to keep all of the goods, all of the things that those nations stood, all of the stuff, you can keep it. It's going to be my gift to you. You can keep it. But, look there in verse 21, real slow here. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, give me the persons. So this king of Sodom, he said, I'm not too worried about the stuff. You can keep the stuff. I want the people. I want the persons. I want all the people that you're bringing back. That's the agenda of one of the kings. Now, we're going to get application in a minute. But the agenda of one of the kings is that he has his hand out. He has his hand out, Abram, and is telling Abram what I want to get from you. A very negative connotation. Well, on the other hand, let's look at the stated purpose of the other king. Look there in verse number 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. So he didn't have his hand out to take. The second king had his hands full to give. It says there in verse 18, he brought forth bread and wine, and he was a priest of the Most High God. Look at verse 19. And he, Melchizedek, blessed him, Abram, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. I, I, I hope I'm not losing it. One king had his hand out to get. The other king had his hands full to give. One king was only concerned about earthly things and earthly people. The other king was concerned about the Most High God. And the other king, his own agenda was to bring the blessing of God on this man, Abram, who had just done right. This is very strange. We don't know who the second king is. They both had two very clear agendas. But then I want you to see how Abram reacted to both of these. Pastor, how did Abram react to the king of Sodom who, who, who said, keep, uh, keep the riches, I'll get the people? How did he react? Well, let's have a look how they reacted. First of all, when uh, the king of Sodom who had a very dark character about him, that king of Sodom wanted Abram, and he said, listen, you can keep the riches. Just give me the people. Notice what Abram said to him. Look again at verse number 21. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Now, we're going to notice two reactions. This king of Sodom that said, listen, you can keep all of the stuff. You can keep all of the things. You, you can keep all of the booty. You can keep all of that. I just want the people. Just give me the people. Abram said nothing to him. I'm not even keeping your stuff because I don't want this world to point at me and say, he made me rich. Sodom made me rich. I don't want that, no. We're, 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 we're trying to see that Abram had a different reaction to each of these kings. What was the reaction to this king of Salem? Well, look there at the king of Salem, if you would, uh, verse number 19. 
Bible, make it verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, that's a good king, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of the Most High God. And he, that's Melchizedek, blessed him, that's Abram, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. He's not got his hand out for anything. He's just wanting to get the blessing of God on Abram. You know how Abram responds to him? Look at the end there, verse 21. I'm sorry, the end of verse 20. And he, Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. What's tithe? Tithes of the tenth. We, we know it's that about giving. Abram said no to the king of uh, Sodom. Abram said, I am so thankful to the king of Salem. To show my thankfulness, I am going to give back a tithe of everything that I have. Now, folks, this is our introduction to Melchizedek. Melchizedek was, again, one of the kings that met Abraham when he came back from the slaughter. Again, Hebrews 7, 4 said, now consider how great this man was. And you see, well, preacher, what was great about this man? He was great because he was look, not looking to take, like the king of Sodom. He was looking to give. Could I say to you that there are two kings that vie for our attention? There are two kings that would like to be your king and my king. The one king, pictured by the king of Sodom, will promise you all kinds of stuff. He just wants the persons. If I could say it, he just wants the souls. But the Bible says, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? There's two kings that want your attention. One will promise you all kinds of earthly things if you will promise him your person. The other one, they don't want anything from him. That other king wants to bless you and reward you and give you spiritual help and spiritual strength. We're trying to learn about Melchizedek, and the first thing that we see is the presentation of Melchizedek. He was a king that meant Abram returning from the battle. He was a good king. He was an honorable king. He wanted God's blessings on righteous living people. Do you know, in all my studying here of this Melchizedek, it said he was the king of Salem. Some would insist that Salem eventually was called Jerusalem. And you say, well, preacher, where did he get that? They say the Jebusites one day took control of Salem, and they renamed it Jerusalem. Say, preacher, what do you think of that? I'm not sure about that. Let me give you a verse that gives stronger proof of that. Look there in Psalm 76. Psalm chapter 76, I think there's a far greater case for why Salem uh, later was called Jerusalem. There in Psalm 76 and verse number 1. Psalm 76 and verse number 1. In Judah is God known, his name is great in Israel, in Salem. Also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. Well, there we know that when the writing of Psalms took place, the headquarters for the house of God was Jerusalem. We understand that that is where the tabernacle was, and yet it's called Salem. So having said that, our first presentation of Melchizedek is Genesis 14. Didn't hear anything about this strange king before, and guess what? After Genesis 14, there's only three verses given about this king. He disappears. He's gone. So let's turn to the next place. Look there in Psalm 110. Psalm chapter 110. Psalm 110, look there in verse 4. So, you know, if anyone were to read the Bible, the Old Testament, and I know during the Old Testament times, all of the 39 books were not together in one cover. I know that. 
That didn't happen until about 13, 1480. But if anybody read Genesis, Miss Melchizedek, all of a sudden shows up, and then he disappears. You don't hear about him in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Joshua. You don't hear about him at all. Any thinking person would scratch their head and say, what was that? <laughs> Who was that king? I mean, how could you just show up and then just disappear? What, what, what's that for? Well, look there in Psalm 110. Now his name shows up again. This is the second chapter in the Bible where his name shows up. Psalm 110, look there in verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Do you know that after 900 years of complete silence about this Melchizedek, his name shows up in Psalms. <laughs> Preacher, what's going on here? Well, Psalms chapter 110, David is recording a prophecy. 900 years after Melchizedek showed up, disappeared, David records a prophecy. Now, David didn't make it. It's something that God said. Look there in Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord, notice capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The Lord said unto my Lord. Notice that's capital L and then small O-R-D. You know, in the Old Testament, whenever you come across capital L, capital O, capital R, capital E, it's always God the Father. Always is. And it shows up a number of other times. You're in Psalms. Uh, look there in Psalm 108, verse 3. I will praise thee, O Lord. Notice that's all capitals. That's God the Father. Notice there in Psalm 109, verse 26. 109, 26. Help me, O Lord. All capitals, my God. Uh, notice there in Psalm 111, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord, all capitals. Whenever you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital, it's God the Father. Now back to Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord, so God the Father, said unto my Lord. This is someone other than God the Father. So God the Father is saying to someone else, and we know that someone else is his son, Jesus Christ. Look again at Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord, God the Father, said unto my Lord, Jesus Christ, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And then look at verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent thou, speaking of Jesus Christ, are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. His name shows up in Genesis 14 and then after three verses disappears. And we look at that and say, okay, Lord, is that all you're going to give us? Well, 900 years later, God adds another detail. And so if you're writing notes down, the first note was a presentation of Melchizedek. Second point, if you would, is the prophecy about Melchizedek. God the Father says to God the Son, you are going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. You're going to be just like him. You know, God didn't prophesy that Jesus would just be like Aaron. God never said that. But God said, you're going to be like this priest. So the second time he shows up, he, uh, God the Father promises God the Son that you're going to be just like Melchizedek. That means what we read in Genesis 14 about Melchizedek is now a picture of Jesus Christ. It's a prophecy about Jesus Christ. That adds a whole lot more meaning to whoever this Melchizedek was. And so if I could, if everything that Melchizedek did for Abraham is a picture of what Jesus Christ is going to do for you and me, how are they the same? Well, let me quickly give you three things. Uh, and I've already given one. There are two kings that want to rule in your life. That is clear when it says that that Melchizedek is a prophecy. Folks, there's two kings that want to rule your life. One is King Sodom. He'll promise you all kinds of riches. But when you buy into his promises, you'll have to sell your soul together. 
That's all in that picture. The other king is the king of Salem. He wants to offer you heavenly blessings. He wants to offer you heavenly riches. And if you'll put him first, he'll bless you with all those things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So there are two kings that want to rule in your life. Second thing that we now look back on that Melchizedek picture is of those two competing kings that want to rule in your life. You have to choose. You, as, as much as the king of Sodom was putting it on Abraham, keep the stuff, give me the persons, Abram had to make a choice. As, as much as the king of Salem brought bread and wine and wanted to bring the blessings of God on Abram, Abraham had to make a choice which way that he'd go. Now, we're grateful that he said no to Sodom and yes to Salem. But you know, the second thing, if that's a picture of what Jesus Christ is going to do in your life, you have to make a choice. And folks, sadly, for the most part, this world wants Sodom. They want the riches of this world. Thank God that there are some old-fashioned Christians that say, take the world but give me Jesus. But it's a choice. Uh, we're looking here at the prophecy. We're, we're told that what Melchizedek is a picture of what Jesus is. Uh, I know that you have Psalms, but uh, I need you to look there again in Genesis 14 to see the third thing. Again, we're looking at the prophecy. How are these two kings uh, like? Again, the, the two kings today are the world, the devil, that's king, and Jesus Christ. Now, you decide that you're going to follow the world and follow the devil. It'll make you all kinds of promises. But you'll have to sell your soul to get it. You'll take the person, as long as he, he'll give you stuff, if he can have your person. Well, that other king, the king of Salem, he said, I just want to bless you. If you just do what's right, I want to bless you. Well, look here in, Psalm, or, sorry, in Genesis 14. Genesis chapter 14, that king of Sodom, look there, verse 17, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him. Look again now at verse 21. And the king of Sodom said unto him, you know what, if you let the king of Sodom, if you let this world be the king of your life, that's all it'll ever be is it'll tell you what to do. That's what a king does. King tells people what to do. Do you know that if you let Jesus Christ be the king of your life, that's the king of Salem, do you know he'll not only be your king, he'll not only direct you in your life and steer you in life and tell you the next step, but you know what else he can be? Look there in Genesis 14, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, for, and he was the priest of the Most High God. If you let Jesus Christ be your king, he'll not only be your king, he'll also be your priest. When you have problems and troubles and difficulties in your life, he will be right there to help you through it. This world can't help you through your problems. All they can be is your king. But if you'll just say, listen, I don't, I don't want that. I, I don't want this world to run my life. I don't want this world to enrich me so that forevermore people will say the world gave him that. He said, I want this other king to be my king. Uh, we've looked at the presentation of Melchizedek. He was a king that met Abram coming back from the battle. He was a good king. He was an honorable king. He wanted God's blessings on right living people. That's the first thing we saw. Second thing we saw is the prophecy about Melchizedek. In every way, he was a type of Jesus Christ. He wants to be your king, and he wants to be your priest, but you have to choose it. With that, we finally get back to Hebrews 7. You can let go of these other places. Hebrews chapter 7. Now you say, well, preacher, I think I've got a pretty good handle on who Melchizedek is. He, just, he was just a great Old Testament king that was a picture 
of what Jesus Christ would do for us. Okay, now you have to deal with Hebrews 7. And I tell you what, I, I said this when we started Hebrews, there are some passages in Hebrews, that's why we've held it off all these years. Well, I want you to look at Hebrews 7. If you're taking notes, the third thing is the fuller picture of Melchizedek. The fuller picture of Melchizedek. I, I wish it was full. It's fuller. You say, well, preacher, what do you mean? I, I, I think I got a pretty good understanding of who he was. Well, let's see. Hebrews 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abram returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. All of verse 1 makes perfect sense. If you have followed everything I've said to this point, you have no problem with verse 1. Well, let's look at verse 2. To whom Abram gave, uh, also Abram gave a tenth of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that, also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now, verse 2 adds something a little more about this character. We already knew that Melchizedek was the king of Salem. Already knew that. But this king is also the king of two other things. Look there in Hebrews 7, verse 2. To whom also Abram gave the tenth part of all, first being by interpretation the king of righteousness. Do you know this king, we're talking about Jesus Christ, this king is the king of righteousness. If you say yes to Christ, if you'll let down the drawbridge and let Christ come in and take control, he will bring with him righteousness into your life. This world says, well, I just want to do what's right. You can't do it without Christ. But I just want to live right. You can't do it unless the king of righteousness rules in your heart. And so again, not only do we know he's the king of uh, Salem, we knew that, but he's also the king of righteousness. You let, you let Jesus Christ take control. Righteousness will describe your life. The king of Sodom can't do that. The king of Sodom will bring wickedness into your life, but the king of Salem will bring righteousness. But not, not only is he called the king of righteousness, verse 2. Hebrews 7, verse 2 says first, being by interpretation king of righteousness, that's the first thing that Jesus will do in life. He will bring righteousness. But notice what else. And after that also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. You know, you let Jesus Christ reign in your heart. He'll bring righteousness. And he'll bring peace. You can be in the midst of a war and God can give you supernatural peace. Sodom can't do that. If you let this world run your life, there will be anger issues, there will be bitterness issues, there will be wrath issues. There won't be any peace. And you find a Christian that they're always torn up about something. They've got the wrong king that's in charge of their life. So we get that from Hebrews 7. We didn't get that from Genesis. We didn't get that from Psalms. Look at the third thing. You say, well, Pastor, that's pretty good. We're getting a fuller picture of Melchizedek, what he can do. He can bring righteousness. He can bring peace. But look at verse 3. You say, I got them all figured out now. Hebrews 7, verse 3 will mess everything you think you had figured out. Hebrews 7, verse 3, without father, without mother. So whoever the king of Salem was, Melchizedek, really, he had no father, and he had no mother? Really? You say, well, what earthly king had no father and no mother? Do you understand that creates a bit of a problem? Well, keep going, verse 3. It says, without descent. So he not only had a lineage before him, he didn't have anybody that came after him. And you know what? Commentators, when they hit that one, they get so frustrated. They say, well, it, it, it doesn't really mean that. Be careful when you correct about it. 
They said it's not that he didn't have a lineage, it's just his lineage isn't recorded. And sure enough, you can't find Melchizedek in the genealogy of Genesis 5. You can't find uh, Melchizedek in the genealogy of First Chronicles. You can't find Melchizedek in any genealogy of Matthew 1 or Luke 3. And so they say, you see there, it, he was an earthly king, just like any other earthly king. He was just not recorded, is what they'll say. That's why it says he had no father, no mother. He had no, well, keep reading verse 3. Hebrews 7, 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Now, pardon? Whoever this king was, he, he never had a start. And he never had an end. You know, as soon as you get to that part, people say, it's Jesus Christ. It's got to be the Son of God. It, 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 that was Jesus that showed up there to meet Abraham in Genesis 14. Because only Jesus could say he never had a beginning and never had an end. And so the commentators, they get to that and they say, well, see, it's got to be Jesus Christ. Look at the next phrase. Hebrews 7, verse 3, uh, but made like unto the Son of God. <laughs> like unto? Well, that just throws out the whole idea that he's Jesus Christ. Uh, folks, do you understand why I wanted to call up one of you other men to handle this? It's just one of these portions that I, I haven't figured out. And yet, he, we were still told in Hebrews 7, verse 4, now consider how great this man was. And you say, well, Pastor, with all of that confusion... Well, we didn't finish verse 3. It says, uh, made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Abideth, that means he's still around. This Melchizedek from Genesis 14, he abideth, he, he's still here. And if that's not enough, the very last part of verse number 3, a priest continually. That means he was a priest back there that could help uh, Abram in Genesis 14. And he can still help you and me today. And when it comes to that, I, I throw my hands up and say, Lord, all that I now can do, because I can't nail him down. My best guess is he was Jesus Christ. But then why would it say he was made like unto the Son of God? I don't know. He said, Pastor, maybe we have to fix the verse. No, that's why all the new Bibles are out. They all think they have to help God out. And so when we get to heaven, you say, Preacher, you always say when you get to heaven, you've got some great questions you'd like to ask. That's one of them. Who is Melchizedek? So with all of that, you say, you're right. I, I have more questions now than I have answers. Then all that I can do is make something practical from what we've already learned. There's two kings that want to run your life. One of them is a wicked, immoral, unrighteous king. He will promise you all kind of earthly things as long as he can own you. That's why he said, you keep the riches, just give me the persons. You don't want to give the king of this world your life. No matter what he promises to give you for it. You know who you want to give your life to? The king of Salem. And all he wants is to bring the blessing of God on your life. If you let him be your king, then he'll also be your priest. And when, see, a, a priest was needed when people were in trouble. And when people were in trouble, they went to the priest and said, could you talk to God and get me some help from God? The king of Sodom can't get you help when you're in trouble. You're on your own, buster, can't help you. But the king of Salem can. And folks, this world is trying so hard to bribe you and to letting the world run your life. But when you get into trouble, they can't help you. But this other king, 
He said, I'll tell you what, I'll bring the blessing of God on you. It'll start with righteousness, and it'll include peace. But you have to make a choice. You say, oh, preacher, I got saved years ago. That, that salvation decision puts you on a guaranteed path to heaven. But you know how many times the devil is still going to try to get you to follow his ways and promise you his things. And so again, I say to you, the third thing, the fuller picture of Melchizedek, boy, there's sure a whole lot of unanswered questions. And uh, maybe, maybe you're thinking, preacher, you know, ever since I became a Christian, boy, things have gotten harder and harder and harder, and maybe, maybe, just maybe I should go, no, don't ever go back. Don't ever go back. And that's what he's saying to these Hebrews. Don't go back. Because you have a priesthood that's better than anything that Aaron's lineage has. You have a Jesus Christ who is of the order of Melchizedek. Now, you know what? Back in Genesis, when we looked at the picture of Melchizedek, we scratched our head. And we said, great guy, whoever he was. Well, when we got to Psalms 110, David clued us in, whoever he was is a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when we got to Hebrews chapter 7 and started getting some more answers, no matter who that Melchizedek was, the picture that we got of him in Genesis 14 now is a perfect match to Jesus Christ, just kind of from a different angle. Years ago, back in the uh, 17th century, some of you would recognize this artist's name. His name is Rembrandt. And you know Rembrandt back in 1664, he wanted to paint a portrait of a famous Roman woman. Her name was Lucretia. And so he painted her. Had her sit in his chair and he painted her and it became a famous painting. It went all over the world. Two years later, he asked her to sit down and just sit in a different way. And he painted her again. Same woman, same artist, same master, but he painted her from a slightly different angle. Well, that painting, it just it went around the other way around the world. And nobody ever got those two paintings together for over 300 years. And people would see that one and say, man, that's a great painting. Whoever that woman went, boy. And then people, they'd travel a bit and they'd come over and say, no, that's a great painting. And no one ever knew it was the exact same person for 327 years. People would see one, but not the other. 327 years later, there was an art gallery that got permission to get both of them. And they put them side by side. And people looked at that one, the other, and the one and the other, and they said, that's the same person. And no one knew it for 327 years. Do you know when people looked at Melchizedek there in Genesis 14, they thought, whoever he is, great man. And it wasn't till Hebrews 7 that it became obvious that was just another side of Jesus Christ. Now, I say all that to say now that you and I are saved, we are to be just like Jesus Christ. And I wonder what you did last week. Did people look at that and say, yeah, that's what God would have done? Or did people look at that and say, no, Lord wouldn't have done that. He said, preacher, I'm going through a difficult time in my life. Then you need to get your eyes off the people of this world and the things of this world and the promise of this world and you've got to look to Jesus Christ. We sang this song earlier, turn your eyes upon Jesus. 
look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Whatever you're facing, he said, preacher, it's impossible. Not with God. You just have to focus on him. Let's pray. Father, we have looked at a very difficult person in the scriptures. I have as many unanswered questions as I have answers. I'm not sure who he was, but he must have been a perfect Old Testament type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we've been reminded that just like two kings were vying for Abram's loyalty, one offered earthly treasures, one offered God's blessing. Abraham had made a choice. He had to make a choice. He had to say no to one, yes to the other. And Lord, this world is constantly tugging at us, promising us the riches of this world if we'll just sell our soul to this world. Help us as Abram to say no to the world and yes to Jesus Christ.